it looked like somebody was bent over and had their head in the window of the deer blind. It either heard me or smelt me, and he pulled his head out of the tent and stood straight up, and that that shocked me. They don't make people that that big. The way it moved, almost as if it was gliding across the beach. I've never seen anything move like that in my life. They were screaming at each other in gibberish. It sounded like a language and they were chuntering away back and forwards, back and forwards, back and forwards. I know what a bear looks like and there is no way on this planet that what I saw were bears. Out here. What's going on now, sir? That son of a bitch is about six foot nine. I don't know. Do you see him now, sir? Yes, I'm walking right at him. Uh-oh. Why did they stop? Welcome to the show, everyone. Thanks for being here tonight. Got a great show planned for you. Uh, tonight, we're going to be chatting with Charlie and his wife, Allison. And they come to us from Michigan. And over a stretch of a couple of years, uh, Charlie and his wife both have experienced very strange things out there in Michigan on this lake where they go to camp and kind of take time off to relax. One of the encounters that happened to Charlie reminded me of an episode I did a long time ago. Um, I'll let Char- Charlie tell the story, um, and then I'll kind of go into it. If you've had an encounter and you'd like to be on the show, shoot me an email. My email address is wes at sasquatchchronicles.com. And if you get a chance to check out sasquatchchronicles.com, you can become a member and get additional shows. Uh, let's jump into it tonight. I want to welcome uh, Charlie to the show. Charlie, thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me, Wes. And I also want to welcome uh, Allison to the show. Allison, thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for being here, guys. And I know all of this just happened to you guys back on uh, Memorial Day. Uh, If you would, Charlie, just kind of start from the beginning. What were you doing and walk us into what happened? Yeah, well, so basically we have... um we're lucky enough to have a a large piece of property up in the upper peninsula of Michigan, uh, about 50 miles west of Marquette, uh, in an area uh, in a town called big Bay, Michigan. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with, with the area, but it's, it's, it's about as desolate as it gets for this part of the country. Um, oftentimes people go up there, you know, live in Michigan their whole lives and they have no idea it's like Northern Canada. It'd be like going to Saskatchewan. Um, so it's, it's very desolate. It's beautiful. Uh, we're lucky to have, um, really no public access to it. So there's no roads, uh, no paved roads, at least there's no 
power boats allowed on the lakes. If you're going to traverse any of the lakes, you've got to use a, you know, an old fashioned rowboat. Um, planes hardly fly over and just about every, every type of wildlife you can imagine is up there. And I've been going up there, you know, since I was a baby. I mean, I think since I was one years old and I've camped and, and fished and, uh, hiked and I've done a little bit of hunting in the area, and I'm I'm very familiar with the um, the uh, you know the animal life that's that's in the area. And about the biggest thing I've ever seen up there is 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 maybe black bear. Never seen a moose. Allegedly, they're they're in the area, but I've never seen evidence of them. Uh, there is there is bobcat and uh, you know everything else that you could think of like coyotes. There is a, a small wolf population that's been growing up in the area. So we um, we decided to go camping up there Memorial Day weekend, sort of on short notice. And when we got up there, we set up our camp and uh, took some time to just kind of relax and take it easy. We did some some fishing and uh, cooked a great dinner and set up a campfire and watched the sun go down. And it was a beautiful night. It was a beautiful dark blue sky with the sun setting behind the mountains and we were watching stars come out and a couple planets became pretty obvious and we just sat there enjoying things like any campers would you know minding our business listening to the to the birds and listening to the crickets and before maybe i'd say i think what was it about 10 o'clock 10 10 15 ish i think probably right, right around 10 it was about an hour after sunset we noticed this, I don't even know how to describe it really. I, so many times I've been trying to verbalize it, but it, for lack of a better description, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna come out and I'm calling it a UFO because I don't know what to call it. But it was a, it was a white, bright object, couldn't have been more than a couple thousand feet up in the air, coming, over the horizon from behind a mountain that was probably about a quarter mile away. And we watched it as it came closer. And I turned to Allison and I said, what in the hell is that? And she said, oh, well, maybe it's the space station. I said, that's not the space station. And it, it started to come closer and it almost seemed like it was literally making a direct beeline right for us. And we just sort of stared at it and it got to, you know, maybe nearly right above us. And it almost seemed like it slowed down as it passed over. It was, it, 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 you know, I, I've thought about this a lot and it felt like it was watching us. It, it, it was that kind of weird sensation. Like you, you felt like somebody was looking down at you. I know that sounds crazy, but, but, but that's what it felt like. And as it went over top, it's, it slowed down a little bit. And, and I noticed that it wasn't really a ball. It was kind of like, I don't know. It was at it, it, it one point it sort of looked almost like a, a oblong, you know, diamond, uh, four three dimensional diamond, or or almost like a cylinder or something along those lines. And then it just kept on going behind the trees behind us, and we kind of just chalked it up as a kind of a weird experience. So, you know, sitting there, uh, I think I was having some bourbon or something like that, and we were just staying warm by the fire. We were chatting quietly. And about three or four minutes later, about a half a mile away to the south of where we were sitting, and we're at the end of a big inland lake. So this inland lake sits maybe, I'd say, five miles from the shore of Lake, lake Superior. And we're at the end of this inland lake. And it was like everything went quiet. And then I heard what I thought was the sound of coyotes yipping. And you know how coyotes kind of like they start up, they kind of go yip, 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 yip. And then they kind of go into their, they go into their call. And I'm familiar with that. I've heard them before. And they went, it went yip, yip, yip. And then it went real high. And then it continued and went really low. Like something was, was, was grunting like almost like grunting in pain, like going, rrr, rrr. and then it overlapped. It was like an overlapping sound of these screams, uh, 
just this, I mean, it was blood curdling screams. Like I thought something was getting torn apart or, or something was tearing something apart. I, I don't know. And then it, it kind of cascaded back into the yips with more screams. And then almost what I would say are kind of like yells. And then it, it kind of just tapered off and then cut out completely. Not a, not a yip, not a cry, not a scream, not a yell, not, not a thing, just dead, complete silence. And Alice and I, you know, we're looking at each other when this is going on and, you know, her, her eyes are wide and, you know, she's, I mean, I can tell she's clearly afraid. I'm just sort of stunned because I've been camping there for, for decades and I have never ever heard anything like that. Um, and I've heard a lot of, I've heard a lot of wildlife down there. So, you know, I turned to Allison and I said, I, what do you think that was? And she says, I don't want to talk about it. I said, no, I, I mean, what was that? She goes, I, she goes, if you don't know what that is, I'm scared. And I was kind of, I just didn't even know what to say about it. And I said, well, well, let's talk about it. She's like, no, I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> she, you know, she just wanted to go into 10 and she, I don't blame her because it was so bizarre. It was so scary. It was so frightening. It was something I've never heard, never encountered before in my life. And uh, what made it eerie to me was this all happened a few minutes after we saw this I don't know what it is, this thing, this thing that came over us in the sky, that it was not a drone, it was not a satellite, it was not a plane, uh, it wasn't a Japanese lantern, uh, it was something else that I couldn't, I couldn't begin to tell you what it could have been. But, you know, in a nutshell, you know, that's, you know, that's, that's basically the story. And I know that you're skeptical of Sasquatch existing, Charlie, or, you know, you're kind of on the fence. Um, did you guys actually go into the forest the next day and, and look for any signs or anything? I wanted to go over there. Um, I, Allison did not. We actually went fishing during the day and we rode down to approximately that shoreline because I wanted to get a closer look. There's, a, there's actually a, a creek that's a freshwater creek that empties into the lake. And that's actually the water source for the lake. And um, this creek kind of goes back about five miles to the south. And then the whole terrain changes to basically tundra. Like it's basically flat. There's they're just plains. Can I ask you, Allison, what did you, can you kind of describe what you saw in the sky that night? Yeah. So, I mean, like Charlie said, it, it didn't look, you know, I'm not too familiar with the sky, but, um, you know, I asked him some questions because he's more knowledgeable than I am. So, you know, I kind of threw out the space station and he said that, you know, that's not what it was. It, like, it was um, too low to us to be that. And then actually the night after, we documented the time that we saw uh, that thing in the sky it was like like 10 15 yeah. and so the next night we looked up at the sky in the same place we're sitting by the campfire and we looked in the exact same position and also around it and we never saw anything like we saw the night before yeah and allison what were you thinking when you were hearing all this strange noise coming from the woods well um, like when it started out like the coyote yips, I'm familiar with coyotes. I used to live out in like the country area. So I'm familiar with that and some other like smaller animals like that. But um, I know that he has more knowledge about that area, especially in all the animals that, you know, roam out, especially at night. So I started hearing the yips and then it kind of transferred into like the deep bellow sound that we heard. And I, I looked to him maybe for some, a glimpse of knowledge or, you know, cause I was kind of getting scared at that point cause I've never heard anything like that. And so I looked at him and his face probably mirrored mine. And I knew that wasn't a good sign because if he didn't know what that was and he's been out here his whole life, then, you know, my, my fear was probably right that you know it didn't feel like 
we were supposed to hear it, I guess. Yeah, no, it felt like we were hearing something that was not meant for us. So I, well, he, after we heard that, and I think I tried to talk to him during, while we're hearing it. And, you know, he, he kind of looked at me and, you know, we wanted to finish hearing the rest of its call or whatever it was. And then afterward, he was kind of excited, but at the same time, like had the same feeling of fear as I did. And he was, he wanted to talk about it. And I'm like, like, no, I'm like, we can talk about this when we are on our way home. And he goes, no, let, let's talk about it. What was that? What, what did we just hear? And I was like, yeah, I think we should um, just go in the tent and maybe wait until morning and maybe I'll talk about it then. Charlie, when you were hearing that, is there anything you would compare it to? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, this is kind of what encouraged me to call you. I mean, Allison actually had mentioned, we've been listening to you. Um, well, Allison's been listening to you for much longer, but she kind of got me into listening to you in the spring. And I'd, I'd probably heard maybe three or four episodes. And, you know, I, it's, it, I, the topic's interesting to me. I, you know, I'm not sure if I'm 100% believer or not, but I'm, I'm not a skeptic either. And so I've been listening to those podcasts and, you know, I, I particularly was foc been focused on the ones coming out of Michigan. And, you know, I was, <laughs> I was listening to it Saturday night, this, this most recent Saturday, and you played an audio clip from, I think it was, I think the, the episode you played it in, the one I had heard was episode 751, but you played a clip um, that was a, a capture out of Michigan and I immediately, you know, turned up my radio and, you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm like, okay, let's hear this, you know. And you played this clip and you guys were talking about, you know, the, the guest you had, I was talking about vocalizations and the pitch and, and, and the volume and how the volume kind of is always loud, but you know, there's, it's like these things don't have a volume knob and you, you played this clip and the minute it started, I, it was a replay. I mean, it could have been identical. That's what, it just stunned me because I've been struggling so hard to verbalize it. And, and I, I said, I used to say to myself over the last few months, I wish I'd somehow captured this on, on video or on audio. And then when you played that clip, it, it was hands down hundred percent, like 90, 90, 99% accurate. And I, I just, I don't know what animal to compare it to other than to me, it felt like three or four different animals all strung together, sometimes overlapping. Like I could hear maybe the sounds of a big cat, you know, like a bobcat, this, this wailing, screaming kind of sound. You know, it, at one point, it you almost could hear sort of like a rutting sound of maybe a deer. And then, you know, the, the yipping of the coyote. But then there was this almost human sound, which was, you know, at times where you kind of heard the windup of this, this maybe possibly cat sound, it was like you could hear the deep breaths almost that we had to go into the animal or into the creature to create that kind of sound. And it was agonizing. So, you know, I, I don't really have any basis of comparison other than that clip that you played on that episode 751 and, uh, you know, a few of those animals I've heard individually. Yeah, sometimes when they vocalize, it sounds like they have multiple vocal cords. Sometimes they'll make, you know, multiple animal sounds. Uh, here's a clip from episode 751. These are sounds uh, recorded in Michigan. played it over and I played it probably 20 times in the last two days. I got gotcha. you. I got gotcha. you. Because, because I, it's just, it's so stunningly similar. And when I heard that was out of Michigan and it, it sounded 
so identical. I thought to myself, geez, I wonder if this happened at the same time in the same area and somebody else had captured it because I was, I was completely shocked at, at how it sounded so, so identical. So you guys end up leaving, but did anything else ever happen uh, while you were out there camping? No, we stayed another night. Uh, like Allison said, we, we watched the sky, you know, around the same time. We didn't have, you know, any, any odd animal noises, any odd sounds, no odd encounters. I mean, everything was, you know, just like a, you know, good old fashioned camping trip, but it was just that, that moment in time that evening, uh, it, it felt like it was just disconnected from reality. And I know there's two more incidences that we're going to talk about tonight. Um, did they happen in a different state? Both incidents happened in Michigan. Both of them happened uh, on the same property. One happened on the same lake, just about a quarter mile away. And, and then I had another separate incident happen on a different lake on the same property. Well, walk us into the, the first one. You were on a lake. Kind of what were you doing and what happened? So the most recent one was two summers ago. Um, we were on a separate lake uh, that's on the other side of this property. So we're probably about five, good five miles away. And um, this lake actually does border some property where there are three houses on it. Uh, all the other lakes are, there's no buildings, no structures whatsoever. Um, so my son and I are, are fishing on this lake. And there's a, um, a boathouse on the lake that houses two uh, rowboats that, you, you know, you can take these boats out for fishing. And we're rowing across the lake, and it's, a, it's probably noon. It's a sunny day. There's a few clouds in the sky. And we're about uh, two-thirds away uh, from the boathouse, traversing the other side to the other side of this lake. And my son is sitting in the front of the rowboat facing the back, so he can see where we've come from. And I, of course, have my back to it as I'm rowing. And he says, hey, Dad, what is that? I look around, and I don't see anything. He goes, no, that. And I, there's some sort of object on the water at the far shoreline from where we had come from, making no sound, no waves, the lake is flat as can be. I mean, you can see every reflection. I actually have a photo I can send to you if you would like to see it. Um, and so I don't have the best cell phone at the time, but I, I try to zoom in and I, I can see the object. It's, it's, it's white. It looks like your standard, you know, propane tank that somebody would have in their front yard, you know, that, that they, you know, they fill up for the winter, like the big, the big ones, um, almost like a submarine really. And it, it doesn't, it's not in the water though. That's the weird part. It's like, it's on top of the water it, it, as if it was maybe not even touching the water, to be honest with you. And the weird part about it is that it's not casting a reflection, despite the fact that it's white and the water is, is black. And we watch this thing. We just stop rowing and we just watch it. It goes, I mean, I'd say the width of the lake at that point is probably, I'd say, maybe four or five football fields long. And the thing's probably going three to five miles an hour, maybe walking speed. And it's just silently going along, going along, going along, going along. And it gets to the shore and I'm thinking, okay, you know, what's it going to do now? And it just goes into the woods. It just goes into the shore. It just disappears into the woods. It, it didn't. It didn't even move. It's like it didn't even go up. It just whoosh disappeared. And my son and I thought, well, <laughs> you know, what the hell was that? You know, what did we just see? And we, we couldn't. We couldn't figure it out because there's no boat launch. There's no access to that side of the shore. Um, and really that area is very, very heavily wooded. So I, I can't imagine what the heck it was. It was bizarre. It made no sense. It made no sound It cast no reflection. And I, I, again, it's something I'd never seen before, but you know, I mean, what do you do? You know, it's, you go tell the world what you just saw and people go, yeah, okay, whatever. You know, it's like a fish story, but we just kind of laughed at it, laughed about it, looked at each other and just chalked it up as a, as a, maybe a, some type of, you know, paranormal experience. So that, that was, 
that was the uh, the most recent story. And Charlie, did you um uh, you have a picture of the object? Yeah, I do. Um, I have two pictures. I have one picture where it's it's basically no zoom, and you can see it just barely. And then I have a picture where I've, I've, I've zoomed in on it and I actually changed it to a grayscale because it's easier to, um, to pick out the object in. And um, I can send those to you if you like. Yeah, would you please uh, text it to me or email me the picture and I'll throw it up underneath uh, this episode if that's all right. Um, as you were talking, I've been trying to find this episode. I did an episode a long time ago. I think originally the episode was Little People. Uh, But I had this guy on, and he was retelling this encounter that happened to him when he was very young. And basically what happened was he was playing, and this little person goes running across the road in front of him. I think he was 13 or 14 at the time. And they kind of lived out in the middle of nowhere. And it ran off into the bush. And then what happened was uh, he describes this small object just taking off. And I think he described it as like a little trash can or, you know, it didn't remind him of what you would think of with the UFO. You know, it wasn't like a flying saucer, but it reminded him of like a little trash can or uh, it was very oddly shaped. I need to find the episode. I've been looking all over for it. But I'm curious if his description kind of matches uh, what you guys saw. Yeah, yeah, please send it to me if you would. I'd love to see it. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to text it to you here as I um, as we're talking. Yeah, man, I appreciate it. And if I find that episode, I'll send it to you, Charlie. Yeah, no, that'd be great. I'd, I'd love to see it. It's, you know, it's 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 like you str- when you see something like that, you struggle to compare it to something that makes sense, you know. And I, I think the reason why my my brain made that correlation was because that part of northern Michigan, there is no natural gas up there, you know, so you know, you, as a utility is concerned. So everybody's got, you know, propane tanks, uh, in their yards. And it was the first thing that came to mind because my mind was trying to associate what it could be. That's, that makes sense. That's in the environment that would, what, 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 what shape like that have I seen in the environment? Well, you know, it's, it'd be a propane tank like that, but what the hell is a propane tank doing floating across well, almost hovering across the lake at a consistent speed. There was no wind and then just disappear, fading into the woods, just as if it was, you know, just going on a trip, just going on a little walk. Yeah, I think the initial thought would be it's probably a UFO, but from your description and the way it went off in the woods, I could see why you might think it was paranormal and it could have been paranormal. Yes, I, um, there's a black and white photo. I just sent it to you. Uh, with all the others and what's interesting is you you can see the shoreline and you know i don't know how familiar you are with with um how deer forage especially in the winter time but a lot of times you know this is this area is mostly cedar along these shores and some hemlock and the deer love to eat that stuff and so there's whenever you go to these inland lakes and you look at the tree line from the shore it's kind of an odd oddity of nature all the limbs all the the lowest uh, branches of the tree are of equal height all the way around the lake because the deer walk along the lake and they eat the bottom halves of these trees and so you know just as a reference point what that height is and that height is you know approximately seven to nine feet all the way around the lake. So when you're looking at this object, uh, you can see it up against the shoreline and you can see you can see the trees. And so you know that it's it's less than you know eight feet you know high. Um, so it's probably about three three to four, maybe five feet high, and probably about seven to nine feet you know long. That's what I figured, which is about what a propane tank would be. Yeah, I'm looking at them now. Very strange. And I'll put them underneath this uh, episode on SasquatchChronicles.com if you guys want to check it out. Um, The last encounter we're going to talk about, did it happen on this lake? No. So, well, the second encounter happened on the lake where where we talked about the first encounter, the one with the scream that we had on Memorial Day weekend. 
And it happened, um, it actually happened nearby a campsite that I used to camp at uh, that, that Allison and I did not camp at, but it's the next, it would be the next point down that's sticking out into the water. And it, it actually abuts uh, this creek. It comes right up to this creek. So it's the end of the lake and you, there is nowhere to go after this. You're, you're then you're going into this creek and it's really kind of a boggy, marshy area with um, the foots of two mountains coming down from either side. And so it's, it's really a low land between these two mountains. And I can also send you a, a picture of that if you'd like to see to get an idea of the terrain. Um, so essentially uh, what we were doing, what I was doing is I was camping down there and I was, uh, this was two, I, I think it was about 2003. So it was nearly 20 years ago. And I had uh, at the time this big, beautiful Siberian Husky and I'd take him camping with me and he'd go out in the boat and uh, we would go out and, and typically do some night fishing right before dusk because where that creek comes into the lake, there's a there's a deep spot where a freshwater spring is, and that's where all the trout are. So we were going to try to get ourselves some trout, and really got ended up with nothing, uh, and rode in kind of before it started getting dark. And this campsite is situated on an outcropping of rock that comes into the water, and there's a small bay, and there's a sort of a lily pond almost, uh, so sort of like a almost like a crescent. Uh, shaped uh, bay and we're rowing in and we're coming in very quietly and all of a sudden the dog gets up and runs to the, f the the front of the rowboat and puts his paws up and he's clearly sees something or hears something and i'm you know i'm saying well, you know what are you doing you know what is it what do you see you know and he looks at me and he looks back at the shore and just as i said that i see like a 12 to 16 foot sapling um for lack of a better description it looked like somebody had tied a string to the very top of it and was down at the bottom and just pulled it down and then it went snapping back up and i thought that was weird and then another tree to the left of it did the same thing and then another tree and then another tree and has progressed along the shoreline towards the direction of where our campsite was, which was probably a hundred yards away. And we were just coasting now into the, into this bay. I had, I had been rowing and we still had a little speed and I just decided to sort of let us kind of coast in in case it was a bear or something like that. I wanted to see what it was. And the, the, the weird part is there was no noise. There was no heavy footfall. There was no grunting but there was a grumbling sound. And the only way I can describe it is that it was sort of like, um, you could feel it more than you could hear it. It was like a hum. It was like a very low frequency, like vroom. And then it, it, that was the only sound I heard. And then there was maybe two or more of these trees bent down and then it stopped, just completely stopped. And so I stood there, sat there in the boat. The dog stood up on the, on the end, and he's, he starts to bark now. And nothing went running. There was no, you know, scattering of an animal or anything like that. And so just to be on the safe side, because I, I just wanted to make sure it wasn't a bear, we actually slowly rolled in, rode into that, that spot where we saw the last tree bend. So I was about maybe 10, 12 feet offshore, so I could peek in there. And there was nothing there. There was, there was nothing there. Now, we pulled up the boat and got out of the boat. And the dog ran over there. And I got to the spot approximately where, the, where, the, uh, you know, where, where we'd seen that, that last tree bend. And we didn't find anything. We didn't find any you know, trees or, or brush or anything that looked like it had been broken or snapped. The one odd thing we did find, and I, I, it's probably just coincidence, is we did find two trumpeter swan carcasses that looked like they had died uh, you know, several days before. I don't, there, once every seven years or so, these swans will migrate up to the area. And that happened to be one of those years. But I didn't really make any association with, with that and in, in what we saw.
But yeah, that that's that was it, and and nothing else happened that night. Uh, it was a normal, quiet night, and uh, you know, I thought maybe it's poachers coming up a trail because um, there is a trail that that does go back there uh, that sometimes poachers will come up. So again, you know, very bizarre, and and something that I never really even thought about again until we heard those screams on Memorial Day weekend. And then I started thinking, wow, you know, I had that 20 years ago. And then two years ago, the thing that my son and I saw, and now this thing in the sky and these screams, that's kind of, that's kind of a lot of stuff. So, so yeah. Yeah. It definitely sounds like a uh, strange place to camp. I can't imagine poachers grabbing the top of trees and pulling them down. You know what I mean? Yeah, it makes no sense. And you see that the weird part, the, the reason I thought it was weird, and it's funny, I remember after it happened, I was trying to describe it to uh, somebody else who, um, who uses the property. And I said, you remember that movie Jurassic Park? You know, with the dinosaurs. And you know, he's, they're like, yeah. I said, he was kind of like that. I was expecting the brontosaurus to kind of all of a sudden stick up his head you know, or something, something that maybe start eating the top of the tree. You know what I mean? And uh, it, it was an unnatural bending of the tree, too, because it didn't make sense. How could the tip of the tree bend down like that? Where are you going to grab it on the tree to, to make it bend that way? And it was just, I, you know, I don't even know what to think about it. It's just it, it happened. It was strange. It didn't make any sense. It was bizarre. And then it just ended. Yeah, it's very strange. The The noise that you heard, um, would you describe it more like, was it more like a growl or was it more mechanical sounding? It was definitely not mechanical. Um, y yes, it, 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 you know, and it's funny because Alice and I have been interested in the Michigan Dogman story. So, um, you know, we've listened to a couple of your podcasts on that, especially the, uh, the wildlife biologist who... Um, gave a, a pretty thorough accounting. I guess he took a shot at it with the 45 and it just bounced off his head. You know, it, it didn't sound canine. It didn't sound like a bear or anything like that. It sounded like a multi species. It sounded like it was trying to, it sounded like something, somebody was trying to copy four different animal so sounds at once and, 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 and spit them all out at the same time if that makes sense. Yeah, that definitely makes sense. You know, a lot of times when these creatures vocalize, people will describe it as uh, multiple animals or something with multiple vocal cords, uh, as we talked about there in the past. But uh, let me ask you, I know you're on the fence with regard to if Sasquatch is real or not, but if you had the opportunity, would you want to see one? Well, you see here's the irony we're, we're going back to that spot uh this coming weekend and you know allison's a little nervous about it and and i am i guess a little bit too I, I i mean i think the odds of of having that kind of encounter are pretty low again at least if i look at it in the context of going up there my whole life and never hearing that but i don't i don't know uh, it's it's a hard it's a hard thing to answer because i don't know what i would do you know Part of me is really, really curious, and I really want to see something physical that I can match that that sound up to because I, I can't process in my mind what could make that noise. Um, if I could witness it and I could witness it in a, in a way that was safe and I knew that I had a way out, I definitely would. Um, if I was wandering through that area and I know that area well and I came up on it, uh, it's not like an area you can run through, you know, I mean, you would, you would, you would get tired way before it would, I would imagine. Um, and you know, if it wanted to get you, it would get you. Uh, and I, I don't know if it's, if it has that motive or not, but you know, part of me wants to see it and wants to know what it was. And then part of me is very, you know, after seeing what we saw in the sky and, and recollecting the, the previous two experiences, I mean, clearly there's something going on, whether they're related or not, I don't know. But, you know, curiosity, the curiosity is strong. It's just at the same time, my, my, my sense of self-preservation is stronger. So I get it. What about you, Allison? If you had the opportunity to see one of these things, would you want to? Yeah, I mean, like he said, we're going up there um, this weekend, and I keep thinking about what we heard, and it didn't make me 
feel very secure. It made me feel really uneasy. So, um, yeah, I, I don't think I'm curious enough to go see what it is. But Charlie, you know, he, he went up there um, a while ago and he wanted to go explore in the woods and see what it is. And, you know, I'm not on that same, um, I guess, pattern of thinking. I just kind of, I mean, I'm glad I experienced, you know, the hearing it, but I don't really want to interact with it again, especially when we're that far out in the woods and, you know, there's, we don't have a car nearby, anything like that to possibly escape except like a tent, but really what's a tent going to do if something happened, you know? Yeah, be careful if you go back. I know curiosity will overtake us sometimes and we'll set aside common sense because of curiosity. And I've done it many times, done a lot of stupid things because of curiosity. But uh, let me ask you, and I ask everyone, Allison, what do you think Sasquatch is? You know, I had this conversation, um, you know, with, with Charlie and the whole, I mean, logic and reason and I guess statistics about it we only know a portion of the ocean and i feel like we don't know we definitely don't know like what is all out there the ocean or on land so you know, there there's definitely a lot of people that s coincide with the same things and what they heard or saw and there's different versions of it and varieties of it but it all kind of is in the same category and relates to one another. So I'm probably a bigger believer than maybe Charlie is, but I definitely think, you know, we don't know everything about the world or the universe. Do you think it's more physical, like a uh, primitive man or more animalistic, or do you think it's something else? See, I think it's more of the like supernatural being. Cause I, you know, because when we talked about the, you know, glowing cylindrical object that happened before we saw the scream or we heard the scream, I feel like they coincide and they're not, it's not a coincidence. Yeah, I hear you. And you definitely could be right. I mean, there's a lot of weird things that go on uh, with regard to these creatures and what people experience. There's more going on here than I think most people are willing to admit uh, what's your take, Charlie? What do you think? Well, you know, I, 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 I'm kind of in Allison's camp on this, but I, I'll tell you, I saw something this weekend on a, a television show that kind of made me think along a different route. And are, are you familiar? Do you know what dolmens are? No, I'm not. I'm not sure what you're talking about. Dolmens are a, a good way of describing a dolmen would be go to Stonehenge and it's, it's, think of, you know, uh, Neolithic, you know, prehistory uh, rock structures that were created for various purposes and people make all kinds of assumptions and arguments as to what these structures were for. Um, there are quite a few of these dolmens uh, throughout Europe in some of the northern latitudes. And the, the, the show pointed out some characteristics that actually line up with a dolmen that exists on this property. Um, it's one of, I think, f six or seven in North America that are known to exist. And this dolmen is on the top of a mountain and it faces, um, I guess it faces south. And so that would be inland. So that'd be fa not facing out towards Lake Superior, but inland to, on the same lake that we were on incidentally. And the dolmen is a, about a 15, well, people figured it's, it's somewhere in the range of, of a couple of tons. It, it doesn't look big, but it is big. It's heavy. Uh, it's probably about the size of, um, oh, I don't know. I'd say if you, if you chopped off the back end of a car about the trunk, and it's, it's positioned on top of three rocks. So uh, it, to get it up on these three rocks would take incredible manpower, even using like a lever to do it. Um, it it's no small feat. And there's been a lot of speculation as to what this was for. Was it for, you know, some believe that it, it was a marker for hunting parties when they, we had land bridges and they used these things to basically kind of traverse the area and, and, and follow game. 
Um, but if you look at what a lot of the dolmen experts are saying is that they were used either for burial purposes as tombs where they would place the body under the dolmen uh, for a set period of time as part of a ritual, which I, I believe comes from the Druids. Or some people believe that they are used to open portals and that some of the explanation of these freestanding dolmens and stone structures around the world were really locations where portals were either naturally occurring and they were to mark them or or possibly you know enhance them or or activate them to some degree so you know i was thinking about it just over the last few days what is sasquatch right and there's this thing this dolmen structure on the property could that be a relationship could in fact the dolmen mark a a portal what's what's interesting about the area the geography of the area it's, it's all precambrian rock it's part of the canadian shield and it's 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 basically two and a half billion year old exposed rock it's very hard to find that in north america you have to go down to north carolina and dig down about 60 feet and that's where they do all that emerald mining um so this is ancient rock and this rock is just chock full of quartz veins i mean there are quartz veins as wide as your leg that just stripe these rocks and theory is a lot of people believe quartz absorbs energy um i don't really know enough about it to to be an expert on it but i think it's unusual that you know this stuff is occurring in the area and on this lake and that dolmen is not too far away uh you know maybe a mile or two row down the lake and with that being said you know if you if you believe that the dolmen has any significance and maybe marks are portal maybe this creature is accessing this area to to manifest itself and you know here I, I don't know i think it's flesh and blood but i my gut feeling is that it's not native uh i i don't feel like it's some type of indigenous creature that survived prehistory it just feels too alien and and the fact that we just don't have enough physical evidence or fossil record to to say hey look this is here it makes me feel that it's something that's transitory it comes and goes it comes and goes and whatever the purpose is of its coming and going i i couldn't begin to, to imagine but i definitely think it i mean interdimensional i don't know paranormal maybe um but there's definitely something about it that's that's not uh it's not from here in my view it's flesh and blood but it's not from here and it, and i feel i know this is going to sound strange to you but maybe it's because of the sighting in the sky i feel like it might be more advanced than us even though the the, the perception is oh well it's a giant ape you know it's 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 almost as smart as a human or it does things almost like a human well maybe it, it does those things that seem human like because it's not human, but we interpret it as human because we have no way to associate its behavior, you know? So I, I think it's something that comes here. I don't know from where it comes and it, it obviously has a purpose or agenda um, or, or a reason for being here, but flesh and blood, yes. Um, other than that, I, I have no thoughts on it. I, I, can't, I can't even imagine what it, you know, what it, what it could be. Yeah, it's kind of a fascinating take, Charlie. Um, makes me wonder if the light that you saw and then the, the noises that you heard that I played earlier, uh, if it's related or if it was just a weird coincidence. Uh, no one really knows. Uh, your your take on it, though, is fascinating. Makes me think, I'm going to have to really look into the, the dolmen because it makes me think about uh, why are they seen? Why does every nation on this planet have a name for this thing? The description's the same. The behavior's the same yet no one can catch up with it. It's bizarre. It's bizarre. I really appreciate uh, both of you guys coming on and taking the time to share what happened to you. Yeah, you're welcome, Wes. I'm glad we could, could share them with somebody where, where it, well, it might be appreciated because, you know, it's not like the kind of thing you can talk to your, uh, your office workers about. Yeah, I hear you. And let me know.